Greetings. Welcome to UE TV. I'm your host, Devron Bruce. And today in studio, we have a very special guest, Mr. Donald Leacock. And what can I say about Donald? He is well known in the social media space, a social media influencer. He is a charity owner. He's an entrepreneur. He is a part-time politician, as I call him sometimes. And the list goes on and on and on. But I think Donald is probably best to tell us a bit more about himself. And today we're gonna have a wide ranging discussion regarding early influences, his contribution to the charity space, where he sees himself going and really inspiring others to contribute to just being good people, as they say. So Donald, or Don. Yes, <laughs> mm, quite the introduction, on. appreciate it. <laughs> just wanna thank everybody at UETV for having me. And thank you for inviting me on the show. Excellent, mm. excellent. So I made mention of the fact that you are an entrepreneur. Correct. You mentioned the fact that you are a social media influencer. Mm -hmm. You have a background in accounting, a strong background in accounting. Mm -hmm. A very, very, very impressive uh, CV so far for your age. Appreciate what, what it. What have been some of the early influences in your life that brought you to this place right now? I would have to say, first and foremost, it have to be my father. He was born and raised in rural Guyana. He worked very hard, came over to Barbados in his early adult years and rose to the top of the legal profession here in Barbados. Um, I like to compare it to how Vibes Cartel talks about his father. Vibes Cartel says in many songs, you know, he'd always say, mommy, where me daddy gone? Me daddy working all day, all night, all the time. That's the exact same way I saw my father. Those were the um, disciplines that he instilled in me. He said, work hard. If, no, if so, nobody's working harder than you, there's no way for you to not reach the top. So the work ethic and the motivation and the drive to do everything I do, whether it be the public service that you talk about, the charity, or just entrepreneurial, just being entrepreneurial, it always comes from my dad. Excellent. Mm -hmm. What I find interesting, you said that your dad is out of a legal profession, mm -hmm. but you find yourself in, I would say, entrepreneurship and accounting. How, how comes you have not followed in your father's footsteps? Because you said, that he's a major influence on mm -hmm. you. So how comes you've not followed law? Definitely. I mean, to be quite honest, I'm very grateful that my little brother, Brian Leacock, did it. He just got called to the bar in England and Wales. Hopefully he'll get called to the bar in Barbados when he decides to return home. But to be truly honest, Devron, I knew that I was going to, not to sound cocky, but I knew I was going to succeed in whatever endeavor I pursued. And I didn't want it to be because my father was a good lawyer that people would say, oh, he's successful in law because my, his father is a good lawyer. There's the legacy there. I wanted to create my own legacy and my own path, and I'm doing pretty well so far. So tell us a bit about this path. I know you've beaten the uncharted <coughs> path, so to speak. Usually mm -hmm. you would have, you know, going to University of West Indies, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you get a job and you probably do a well, master's when, and what's not. Well, when I was 18 at Harrison College in upper six, you had to pay for university here at the University of the West Indies. So it really didn't make much sense to come to school here in my opinion and in my parents' opinion. I was fortunate enough to do well at CXEs in Cape and I was awarded an academic scholarship to study at the University of South Florida. And at the time, their tuition fees with my scholarship were cheaper than going to UE right here in Barbados, which is laughable. So I'm very glad that students at UE can now come back free of charge. But while I was over there, I got two degrees. I worked, uh, I got a degree in accounting and finance, accounting with a minor in finance, and then a separate degree in international business and economics. So two bachelor's degrees. Excellent. Mm -hmm. and, and since then, what have you been up to since these two bachelor's degrees? I worked in America for a year and a half after completing the bachelor's degrees. I worked at Ernst & Young, a pretty reputable accounting firm. I learned a lot, just a wide variety of financial knowledge at that firm, working for some high net worth individuals. At that time, it was 2018, Trump was the president of America and it was very hard to continue getting work permits and visas and whatnot. So I did have to leave the country. I transferred to their Bermuda office and that's where I worked for the last two years up until early 2022 last year when I moved back to Barbados. So the majority of my professional work experience has just been working with very high net worth individuals, whether it be in Florida or Bermuda, and trying to find the most tax efficient ways for them to run their businesses, pay as little tax as possible. And that has just given me so many connections in that space that I've able, even been able to use in this charitable space that I am now. Um, unfortunately, in society, it is the wealthiest people that are able to give back the most. So it still definitely helps to, to know them. 
so you meant you made mention of the Bermuda experience, mm -hmm. you made mention of the US experience. Mm -hmm. Have those experience experiences rather influence your work in the entrepreneurial space? So you see you're an entrepreneur. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What what type of entrepreneur, what space are you in as it relates to entrepreneurship? So right now I run my own financial consultancy. So I do tax work, accounting, and any kind of financial advisory for businesses in America, still a couple in Bermuda, and now here in Barbados, trying to grow my book about here in Barbados. I'm licensed to practice in America and in Barbados, and through social media, I've been able to garner a lot of American clients because it makes, you know, you're able to put your work and your expertise in front of so many other people. And that's something that I would encourage a lot of UE students to do. When you graduate from UE, don't just think to look on, like in Barbados Today and Nation on the job boards. Mm -hmm. Look at the entire world, go on to LinkedIn, start posting about um, the work you do on LinkedIn. If you're a marketing graduate, start talking about different ways that businesses can grow on social media, stuff like that. Somebody all the way in New York or Malaysia or wherever in the world might pick up on you and be like, wow, that was amazing. I would love to hire them. And they're very simple ways to earn your money through PayPal and other international mm -hmm. exchanges. So I really think that uh, UE students on a whole need to think bigger, think broader in terms of how they earn money and don't really be stifled by your current geographic location. In addition to the accounting, which is the majority of um, the work I do, I'm a licensed real estate agent. So I rent houses, I sell houses here in Barbados. I'm very active in the real estate market in America too. I have flipped houses where you buy a um, pretty much a demolished house, mm -hmm. you renovate it and you sell it back on the, on the market for a premium in a short period of time. I own a condo in Tampa as well. So very involved in the real estate market over there. And here in Barbados, I do some hydroponic farming as well. I recently got into that through a grant from Ashley Lashley. Shout out Ashley Lashley all the time. She's another great um, young entrepreneurial charitable person here mm -hmm. in Barbados. And she gave me and my business partner, Rishi Panjani, a grant to start a hydroponics farm. Hydroponics use 90% less water in a water uh, scarce country like Barbados. Mm -hmm. That's definitely useful. And it just is, enables us to, in the longer term, reduce food imports, mm -hmm. to, be, to be quite frank. And that's the vision that we want to take the hydroponics with. Currently we grow lettuce and Rishi is trying to expand into cherry tomatoes and a lot of other products as well. So that we won't need to be importing all of these products and we can have a positive effect on GDP hopefully. So I made mention of the fact that you have a long CV at this point. I'm yeah. hearing accounting, I'm hearing entrepreneurship, I'm hearing investment, I'm hearing real estate. Mm -hmm. where, where did the charity aspect now come into play? Because you seem to be doing quite well for yourself. So where mm -hmm. now did build, build up BIM mm -hmm. come into play? What, what were you thinking? How was it conceptualized? What were the influences for your charity? Well, I've always been relatively charity minded. My father as well, who's one of my greatest influences, has always been charity minded as well. Um, I've grown up with him, watching him help out different organizations in Guyana, even though he, he lived in Barbados all through my life. I actually only ever visited Guyana for the first ever time after he passed away. I used to ask him to go. He'd be like, oh, no, there's nothing over there for you. <laughs> But I used to, you know, see him sending back home money to his family to, uh, and to organizations and charities over there. I would see him helping out a lot of underprivileged people here in Barbados. So it just felt like the right thing to do to continue on to, in his legacy. But what really, really pushed me was when I moved back to Barbados, January 2022, last year. That's when they started, the charity really conceptualized and that's where we really started. Because I hadn't really lived in Barbados for my adult life. As I said, I left after sixth form at Harrison College all up until last year. So for the first eight years of my adult life, I've only had eight years of my adult life, but for all eight of them, I had lived abroad. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't really, when you live abroad, obviously you're not gonna be privy to the harsh realities of society here in Barbados. I feel like Barbados is a lot worse off than when I left it eight years ago. Um, shockingly so, I won't go into all the details, but um, I did run in the election, as you said, that's what makes me a part-time politician. And meeting those thousands of people, literally thousands of people in that three week time period in the campaign really opened my eyes to a lot of these stories, a lot of the struggles that Bajans are facing. So the majority of our campaign work and the money that we spent during the campaign were actually like long-term things. Like we built a garden for the people in St. Christopher and Silver Sands. 
in Christ Church that they still use to today to cultivate fruit. We chopped down some bush with swords and created four large garden boxes for them to do. So just doing all of that work, um, hosting some children's events and whatnot in the community while COVID was going on and they hadn't been able to party in years. Mm -hmm. Like the year, I still walk around the community to today, about 18 months later, and people are like, Don, that children's party you held last year, that was amazing. That was mm -hmm. one of the best things ever. So I mean, just the genuine um, joy that people share with me that I've helped them, that really pushes me to keep going and motivates me to just see everybody be able to live the kind of lifestyle that we all deserve to here in Barbados. Excellent. So, so tell us a bit more about Build Up Bib. Is, mm -hmm. Does it have any specific focus? Is it mm -hmm. a children's charity? Mm -hmm. Is it for women? Or does it have a broad net? So tell us a bit more about your charity because I know that it yeah. won, mm -hmm. I believe, an award from the Barbados government last it year. Did. It did indeed. So for it was the 2022 Community Organization of the Year. And, and you know, for a charity that started in 2022, I really appreciate their recognition of that. For someone as outspoken against the government as me, it was, you know, refreshing to see them give that award and not you know it wasn't partisan or anything so kudos to them for that so build up bim as it did start last year we're trying to cover as many areas of society that need help as possible right now the main influences we have would be the po poverty alleviation in which we're trying to model ourselves after salvation army something mm. like that where we just we do a lot of food drives we do a lot of work with the homeless and that would be the poverty alleviation side of it. We do a lot of mentoring in the youth. So we get volunteers to come and spend time with them, similar to how YMCA or another youth group would as well. So that would be the youth farm of it. And then we recently, with the help of Massey, we've started a, a period poverty alleviation oh. campaign <clears throat> where we're donating hundreds of sanitary pads to various secondary schools throughout the island so that girls can come in and get them for free. So it's really wherever we see, not necessarily to say it's a crisis, but wherever we see people in need at that point in time, we're definitely going to try our best to help. We're still working out to, we're still trying to niche down our specific areas of focus, mm -hmm. but I would definitely say it would be youth empowerment poverty alleviation for the homeless and then um, women that are underrepresented as well those would be the three main points that we're on right now excellent you spoke to some of the successes of the charity mm -hmm. thus far uh, the targets and successes for mm -hmm. instance and a short period of time as well mm -hmm. when you think of the charity space what are the difficulties that you have experienced and what advice you could po possibly give someone who wants to get into that space it's ridiculously different. I mean, a lot of people wouldn't even believe me now if I said I haven't even been able to obtain a bank account for it yet. You walk into a bank, uh, people see a young Rasta man, they're like, what on earth does he know about charity? And I'm just being real, I have to tell the camera that. That's definitely the biggest difficulty that I've had. I've registered Build Up Bim as a charity in America as well and gotten a bank account as a non-American. Can you believe that? Me, a Barbadian national, got a charity registered in America with a bank account before I could do it in my own country. Wow. So it just shows that the prejudices of I'm not calling out any one bank in particular because I've been to multiple and one flat out denied me and others have just stalled out to the process where it's nauseating so I would say definitely that would be the key hurdle you have to get over to start with but it's just a lot of people thinking that you're doing it's just people are always questioning your motive like why are you doing this like you didn't have to do this you didn't come from a, one of these at-risk communities you never experienced any of this yourself like why why is it that you feel so strongly against that I mean and all I can tell you is that I have a pure and clean heart and this is what I like to do. This is, I enjoy doing it. I enjoy putting smiles on a few people's faces. But there is a lot of, there is a lot of controversy all the time. People will always, you know, try to make you feel bad about it. One of the w main ways that we fundraise is that we tend to post a lot of the activities that we do. So when mm -hmm. we do a food drive, you know, it'll be on Instagram. It'll get thousands of views, tens of thousands of views, maybe even a hundred thousand. But then with that comes comments about, um, oh, you're shaming people, like mm. you're showing up the poverty and whatnot. But it's not really about that. Again, it just goes back to the motive that you personally have in your head. I'm not out here. I've always been courteous. I've always asked people's permission. The mm. people that have spoke on their situations to me, we've been in some very dilapidated houses and buildings similarly to how Barbados today and the nation do it. But they never get those criticisms because they're an established media house. But when I do the exact same thing, people tend to criticize and they're like, how, why is he going into these people's houses and trying to get their story? Who is he? You know? Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of that until you gain 
gain that legitimacy of being around for a couple of years and people really know you're the real deal, they're always going to criticize, they're always going to hit hard. And you just need to be strong. You need mm. to have a strong mentality, a strong will, and just be able to overcome it all. I would definitely say for anybody that wants to get into the space, um, I had the resources to start my charity myself. And for the first couple of months, I was expending all of the money that the charity was expending. So most people aren't in that situation. So I would definitely say join an organization. There are a lot of great ones. If you want to deal with the youth, you can do YMCA, YWCA, which is the female version. Rotary Barbados is very good. And there are a couple other ones. And then just whatever space you're in, whether you want to be in a climate change charity, you could talk to Ashley Lashley or some of the mm -hmm. um, environmental ones as well. But I would gain that experience. You can even do it here uh, at UE through your give back hours. Don't do your give back hours at a company or anything. Do them at a charity or a nonprofit organization in which you would like to gain some more experience in. And that would definitely be the easiest way to go about it. You'll have it on your CV. And then you can even get ideas on how to start your own from there. Excellent. And I think mm -hmm. you made mention of partnerships, for instance, mm -hmm. that might have helped you along the way. Do you want to mm -hmm. speak about some of the partners, maybe not by name, but how they've mm -hmm. assisted you going forward? Is it funding? Is it mm -hmm. uh, expertise? Is it, you know, putting you onto someone who may need help? How mm -hmm. partners around you helped you? Yeah, definitely. I would say that I'm in a very unique position, especially for someone my age. I know a lot of the most powerful people in Barbados, whether that be ministers or business owners, some of the biggest um, business tycoons in Barbados. But I also know some of the poorest people, a lot of the homeless people I'm on a first name basis with. And there are very few people in the country that can say that, that they're on a first name basis with ministers and homeless people. Mm -hmm. So I'm able to use those connections as kind of I'm just a middleman. That's all I see myself as. I know the people that need it most, and I know the people that can definitely help those people the most. So I just try to leverage that as many ways as I can possibly. Um, my f the company I used to work for in Bermuda has helped me terrifically. I'd say they've been one of my biggest um, donors so far. They constantly give me laptops to give away to children. And a couple of, I'll have to shout out Terra Caribbean as well. They help with our food drives. Terra Caribbean, the real estate company, definitely shout them out by name. I would definitely shout out Chicken Barn by name. They help us with a lot of chicken to provide to um, some of our at-risk families and then just snack boxes for various children's events we do mm -hmm. as well. So there are a lot of companies that have shown their support. There are a lot of, uh, obviously there are a lot of people that just, you know, say that they'll support you and never end up supporting you. But it's tough. You do have to follow up. And many people, I would say, are extremely scared about asking for money. Mm -hmm. And that, what I would say, is the most challenging thing. Because it's not, I get around it because I can justify it to myself. I'm not asking for any money for myself. Yeah, so. so when I go, if I was like, hey, Devron, I would love a $100 donation to help the people of Barbados. It doesn't ever cross my mind that I'm just asking for money for you. But a lot of people, even some of my volunteers are even like, oh, Don, I'm so scared to even send this email to this company asking them for a small donation or anything. Because, you know, we're so ingrained in society that money is just like a hush hush thing. And topic, but money is everywhere. There's yeah. lots of money all over the world, and you just have to change your mentality towards it. I would say. So that was a bit veering off the topic. But yeah. <laughs> That's perfectly fine. Uh -huh. No, you mentioned uh, scalability at one point, and mm -hmm. I made mention of the fact that you are, I would say, pretty large on uh, social media, particularly Correct. Instagram, for mm -hmm. instance. Mm -hmm. How have you utilized that platform to assist you in your charity work, for instance? I would say that's been my greatest blessing. Um, December 2021, which wasn't so long ago, I probably had about 800 followers. Now across all of my pages, I have crossed the 30,000. And that has helped me in the charity space the most, because as I say, we post a lot of the things we do. And I remember one of the very first videos we did was with Same Chicken Bar and Chipping. Chicken Bar and gave us five, six snack boxes to give away in the community to kids. Somebody messaged me and was like, oh my God, Don, that was so amazing what you did for the kids. Um, I own a mattress company. I have some mattresses here to give away. Mm -hmm. So then we were able to provide a homeless guy with a mattress and then three families with mattresses as well. After that video, some, that is when my former company in Bermuda came in, was like, oh my God, Don, we see the work you're doing since you've left us. They're giving away mattresses, food, everything. It's so impressive. Here are six laptops to go and give away. Mm -hmm. So it 
just keeps getting bigger and better. It's like a snowball, it's a snowball effect. effect. So I am eternally grateful as my platform continues to grow. I have to utilize it with respect. I can't say a lot of the things that I would have said when I had, you know, less than a thousand followers. <laughs> you have to, you have to be very cautious um, and cognizant of what you put out there to the world because it can be used to your detriment very often. But it's helped me enormously in the charity space. I would say it's even just the number one driver, the number one factor. Being able to show prospective donors the yes. work we've physically done. A lot of charities can't do that. You might, you're like, for example, I work with the YMCA a lot, so I'll reference them. They do a ridiculous amount of work. I would love to model the youth arm of our charity straight after what they do. But there's, they don't like have anything physical to show for it. They mm -hmm. don't, obviously people know they're doing that yeah. work. They've been around for over a hundred years. So the, um, they know it's there, but they can't actually show like a session, a mentoring session or anything. Mm -hmm. They don't have that. And that's the distinct advantage that we have. We record everything from our mentoring sessions with the children to our food drives to everything else. And people love that kind of content on social media. The government and everybody else here always tells people to be very careful, very cautious, and don't consume too much on social media. But that's because there's so much negative mm -hmm. uh, energy on social media. We bring light and positivity to that space. So I think w there wasn't really anybody in Barbados doing that um, so publicly and the way that we do it. And I think that's why we're having the success that we are so fast. Uh, just to close off that point, in business as well, Social media has helped me enormously. The majority of the clients that I work for right now through in accounting, I got solely off of social media. Mm. There are guys in Manhattan, Florida, multiple states all across America that literally just replied to one of my videos or commented on one of my videos like, oh, that was an interesting tax strategy you shared. Can you tell me more? We talk more. Couple weeks later, I have a contract to do their accounting for the next couple of months. So social media is a really powerful tool if used for good. A lot of people just like to share jokes and funny stuff on it. You know, I, I you have included. one of my characters <laughs> that is a comedian as well. But when you need to get down seriously, if you're going to open a business, I would say that that's the number one asset you'll have. For free, you can advertise your business. When has that ever been possible before? 10 years prior to now. You would have had to go pay hundreds of dollars for a radio ad. Mm -hmm. uh, if you wanted to be on CBC in a scenario like this, you would have had to pay hundreds or thousands of dollars as well. Whereas you can just pick up your phone and be in everybody's living room, everybody's bedroom, um, and cater your message specifically for them. So I would say definitely use social media as a tool for good, you know, opposed to what most people use it for. Totally understood and agreed. Mm -hmm. So you spoke about, for instance, uh, how social media has allowed you to grow, for instance. Mm -hmm. What is next for Build Up BIM and what is next for Don Leacock going forward? How do you see yourself growing from here? For Build Up BIM, I just continue along the long, hard road, you know, that we're currently trotting. There's a lot of work to be done. Um, I was talking to someone at the UN the other day and they were telling me, you know, they love my work. They love um, the charity aspect of what I do. But it's just annoying that it's needed. You know what I mean? Like he was saying, he's been in Barbados for quite some time. And he's shocked that we need new charities to do the same kind of general community outreach work all the time. But the reality of the situation is that um, poor people are getting poor in this country. We live in a capitalist world. Poor people are getting poor everywhere. So there is going to be an increased need for this type of ability. I would love to get some more partnerships, government included, to do some bigger mentorship programs with the youth. Um, par partner with the National Peace Program and other initiatives that they currently have on, the, um, on their radar. Get some bigger partners like the UN, UNICEF, all of them on board. I feel like almost two years in now, we have that kind of legitimacy that we need to get those kind of people on board. And that is when you can really truly get the funding to enact actual change. If we can have a group of, we can take our mentoring groups from 10 to 100 at a session, you know, with refreshments and everything, that's what we would really need. Because, and all of the youth in the country would chime in and be like, oh, what are these sessions? We really need to be a part of it too. Mm -hmm. And that's what you really need. That whole, you need the whole country to get behind you and, and really support. Mm -hmm. And a local bank account as well. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Definitely. Let's not, forget, let's not uh -huh. forget that one. So you spoke about where you see Build Up Bim going. Mm -hmm. Now, you as an individual, where do you see yourself going? Do you want to head in one particular direction or the other? For instance, entrepreneurship, social media, politics, charity, mm -hmm. uh, professional spaces. Where do you see yourself going? Do you want to continue keeping that broad mix or do you mm -hmm. see yourself 
heading in one direction or the other. Yeah, I mean, right now in my life, I'm trying a lot of different things, as you 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 highlight all the time. Um, prior to 2022, I was just a nine to five accountant. I wasn't really anything else. Um, but I really enjoy this lifestyle a lot more. Being able to do the accounting on my own, which is what I went to school to do. But then being able to mix in some real estate, some investing, some working with brands on promotional Instagram videos, um, acting and doing all kinds of other things. I really enjoy sport. It. I, the sport, yeah. <laughs> I really, uh, farming, everything else. So mm -hmm. I really enjoy uh, the flexibility of what I have to do. Now I would say I'm even more busy a lot of people like to glamorize the entrepreneurship lifestyle. It, there's really nothing glamorous about it. If you don't work, you don't get paid. Mm. A lot of, there, there are no sick days. There's nothing like that. And um, that can be extremely tough for people that aren't really used to it. So, I mean, I'm trying my best right now to just grow. You have to think about it in a very long-term sense. It takes 10,000 hours, as a great book, The Outlier says, to be good at anything. And that's about six to seven years in real life. Mm. So if I put in the work as a chartered accountant here in Barbados, in eight to nine years, I'll be one of the best in Barbados. If I continue putting in the work as a real estate agent, uh, eight to nine years from now, I'll be one of the best real estate agents in Barbados. If I continue putting in the work on social media, eight to nine years from now, I'll be one of the biggest social media influencers in Barbados. And when you couple, the, triple all the, those three things together, you have one of the most outstanding citizens in the whole country. And then I know you would love me to, you know, talk about the politics and whatnot. I would definitely love to run again. Um, I ran independently last time. I can't really tell you whether that will change or not, but I do want to represent the people of Barbados. I already do. I have one of the lower, largest voices for change in the country, and I want to keep it that way. I do want to advocate for people. There's something my father used to do on the legal side, a different, uh, one of the different branches of government, but he wanted to be a politician as well, and it was something he never got to fill out his dream due to his uh, early passing away, but it's definitely something that I would love to do as well. Excellent. You, you said that entrepreneurship is not glamorous and mm -hmm. people think entrepreneurship is not glamorous when you don't work, you don't get paid, you're no sick days, there's no vacation, what's not. What are some of the things that you think can assist young entrepreneurs in particular to get ahead? What are some of the things that maybe government can do, the private sector can do, the NGO space can do that can assist young entrepreneurs in this unglamorous lifestyle? Uh, something that was really big in America, which I got first introduced to at university. I'm sorry I didn't start any businesses over there in America on a major scale while I was there, but they have think tanks. Like They have lots of different... It, it could be even something as simple as the Ministry of Youth in Sky Mall um, opening up a room this size for mm -hmm. entrepreneurs to all come to and just brainstorm ideas together. I'm a very big fan of the mastermind principle, which means that when two people sit down together, it forms like a third mind that wasn't really there before. And it um, just helps the overall creativity process of everything. So bouncing ideas off of people, but it has to be the right people. Mm. You have to tell big ideas to only big people. You can't tell big <laughs> ideas to small minded people because, you know, I, even, for example, your family and friends. Um, mm. Easy example, my mother, uh, when I moved back here in January, she was like, y you went to school abroad, you worked abroad for the last five years, why on earth are you back here in Barbados? You quit an amazing job in Bermuda to come back here to Barbados to do what? Nothing to be unemployed. These are words she actually <laughs> told me. And you know, she can't be mad about it. These are the words that she said. So even my own family was very shocked and appalled at the decisions I made. But sometimes you have to risk it all for only a vision that you can see. So I would definitely, to answer your question more specifically, uh, open a, a, some brainstorming groups and think tanks. So entrepreneurship competitions would be amazing. Let some elevator pitch type competitions where you can go in, give a 90 second pitch or even a full business mm. plan pitch of your company and your idea and you'll Almost be able like to win, win some funding. Yeah, <laughs> yes. just like Shark Tank, that'd be amazing. I might even start it myself <laughs> now, that we, now that we've come up with the concept. But just different things like that, make it more fun, make it more appealing. Uh, because the reality is lots of people are graduating from UE. UE is free. So that means that we're all going into the workforce with the same bachelor's degree and it will be harder. Mm -hmm. There are not enough jobs in Barbados for all of these people that graduate, and that's just the harsh reality. We can't just spawn jobs from somewhere. So a lot of these people are going to have to go into entrepreneurship. So they really do need all of the resources at their disposal to try to make it happen. So funding, obviously that's most entrepreneurs 
biggest concern. And then there is a lot of red tape and bureaucracy. I find if I personally, who has a really good track record, no criminal record or anything, find it this difficult to open a bank account, I can't imagine how difficult it is for other people. Mm -hmm. um, so removing a lot of the red tape, you know, it is very easy to register a business at Kaipo now online. There's no need for lawyers or anything. Uh, yeah. So it makes the process a lot less expensive. Um, but just genuinely support the initiatives. And then it needs to go all the way back to secondary school as well. We need to curb the mentality that the only good jobs are, you know, lawyers, doctors, engineers, accountants, which are all nine to five professions pretty much. We mm -hmm. need to make it normal and acceptable um, to become a YouTuber mm. or something other than that that make more money than all these yeah. lawyers, doctors and everything else. So it needs to be a whole mindset shift from like the teenage years. Obviously that will be quite difficult to do, but those are just some things that different sectors of society can do. That is interesting because I think what I missed was the fact that you are a, were a pro golfer. Uh -huh. j j just to add, <laughs> just to add more lyrics. To that was a on. very brief um, <laughs> moment in time, so I don't, mm -hmm. not bring it up too so often. You don't think it had an influence on where you were, discipline, skill. Definitely, I played a lot growing up. Yeah, my mom went to work at the Barbados Golf Club when I was five years old, so golf became free to play. I was the only, you know, black boy playing at the time, and um, I got really good. I used to destroy <laughs> everybody else that was playing. <laughs> Um, so I really rose really quick. I traveled, I've traveled the whole world representing Barbados with the Olympic Association, with the Barbados Golf Association. I've gone to California, I've gone to Great Britain, Scotland, Ireland, Will, ever, all the countries representing Barbados all over. And the biggest thing that I would definitely say golf has given me is a lot of those connections. A lot of the people that, you know, assist me with Build Up BIM knew me from a child. Um, when I was playing on the golf course then and it just goes back to using and leveraging my network I know a lot of the most powerful people in the country and then I also know a lot of the poorest people in the country So I would say golf definitely helped me in terms of it teaches you patience mm -hmm. and Virtues hum Patience and I would say honesty are mm -hmm. the two main rules of golf that you learn and those are very key to life as well so those and the connections made on the golf course definitely the, the biggest assets. And you see, I think that's often missing in our mm -hmm. discussion because we all just push persons or young persons who may not do well in the academic space into mm -hmm. sport and say, you know, they yeah. can make money from sport and what's not. But we never make the fact that sports is really about connection. Correct. It's not just a skill, yeah. mm -hmm. it's about who you meet. Mm -hmm. And in meeting those persons, how can you use those persons to your advantage and others' advantage as well too. So where do you think we should go regarding uh, the issues of sport, for instance. I know we like track and field in Barbados, we like, mm -hmm. you know, some football and what's not, but do you think we're selling it in the right way? Is it really about the sport or is it about the exposure and connection? It's a really interesting question. I mean, you could tackle it a, a number of different ways. What I want to start by saying is that you need to normalize sports as a profession as well. Even if you don't want to normalize it as a profession, normalize it as a way for higher education. Mm. It's so easy. Not so, I can't ever say that. It's not so easy, but it is a lot easier than you think to get an academic scholarship to go away to Canada, America, or England for higher education. Even if you don't become a professional, you've got a free university education and you've mm. made all of the connections that you reference in foreign countries. Connect, you have to think, I, I want the young adult population that watches to really think away that you need to think beyond the Caribbean shores. The Caribbean in itself is much larger than Barbados, but you need to think far beyond the Caribbean shores to think. So even if you use sports as a way to make connections or a way to get to higher education, or if you go through and become a full professional in it, look at a lot of the athletes that don't make it to the Olympics. Uh, I don't want to call any of them by name, but uh, some of them, you know, have gone out of, Represented Barbados at the Carifta level, got an academic scholarships, trained in America, but haven't been able to go pro. But now they're still making good money in America as coaches, mm -hmm. as fitness trainers, as therapists, stuff like that. So there's the auxiliary aspect of sports that makes a lot of money too. So I would say that you definitely need to have the same mindset shift that I was mentioning to YouTube earlier around sports. And Beijing parents, Caribbean parents on a whole, need to support their children a lot more if they say, hey, I really do want to pursue this sport. Because there are easier ways to make money. And our economy really can't mm -hmm. um, deal with the high level of university graduates that are graduating all the time with no job prospects. It just makes the whole country look worse. Um, so, so, yeah.
Excellent. Mm -hmm. So as we begin to wrap up, Don Lickot in 10 years, who mm. will Don Lickot be in 10 years? Possibly Prime Minister. <laughs> 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 that's, that's definitely one of my main goals um, through running, but we'll see about that one. But in 10 years, just relatively on the same path, as I said, I'm going to continue my entrepreneurial endeavors. I would like to be one of the most respected chartered accountants in the island, one of the biggest real estate agents in the island, and definitely want Build Up BIM to be the most impactful charity in the island by then. I would hopefully have started like Build Up TNT, Build Up Jamaica, because hmm. that's the goal. It's never just to, as I, I can't be preaching, think big and be on the shores and not doing well, it Well, after myself. all, your name is Caracom Don. Caracom Don, <laughs> yeah, so. definitely. Um, so yeah, I would love to partner with like-minded individuals all around the world. We can have Build Up Brooklyn in New York, Build Up Brixton, any places <laughs> where the African diaspora is um, plentiful. Uh, and need our help, I would love like-minded individuals to, to help fight the cause as well. So just keep growing all of the things that I'm working on right now. Um, there's going to come a point where I realize like one thing is working way better than the next. Like mm. For example, I might two, three years from now, I might be selling an outrageous amount of houses and I might quit doing accounting and just mm -hmm. fully focus on real estate. Or like the poverty, alle poverty alleviation arm of Build Up BIM might get a significant amount of funding and we might need to focus on that more specifically than mm -hmm. anything else. But once you're working towards the wider vision that you have in your head, that's all, that's all I really can say for now. Excellent. Mm -hmm. So we've been having a discussion with Don Leacock, who has, as I said, an extensive background despite his age, strong background in sports, strong background in entrepreneurship, retail, or rather real estate, I should say. Uh, background in charity, background in politics, it, it doesn't end with Don Lico, apparently, yeah, and, mm -hmm. and several goals going forward. So it really has been a pleasure having a conversation with him today on UETV, and thank you so much, Don, for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for the platform, and thank you. <laughs> Excellent. So I've been your host, Devron Bruce. Thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm.